All right, so we've had a couple of weeks of kingdom finances, and uh, you'll, you have two handouts. One handout is just the same one that you got in each of the last two weeks. Those are the 20 principles that we've gone over. And, you know, remember what the, the point of that was, was really to build the firm foundation that we need. We can't really expect to make progress in finances if our relationship with the Lord and our hearts aren't right, in the right place. And so those 20 principles were really pulled from scripture and we went over a lot of scripture so that we could have that firm foundation of kingdom finance scripturally based so our heads and our hearts are in the right place. And so you'll, I'm not gonna go over all of these again, but you recognize them and they are in the smaller of the two handouts these 10 principles on this page and the 10 principles on this page. And they were, we talked about tithing, we talked about uh, doing God's word, the law of reaping and sowing, uh, all of those things, giving cheerfully and quietly. These are all really designed to put us in the right place so that we can begin to receive God's blessings uh, for us. So before we go any further into this session, we've had the summary, I'm not gonna to forget to pray. So Father God, we thank you. We thank you for these past few weeks. And we ask now, Lord, that those principles not only will be part of our head, but also part of our heart as we move forward in today's lessons where we are really getting into the nuts and bolts of finance. I just pray right now that each of us have our eyes open to what you have for us and our hearts to receive the learnings and teachings that we need in order to have financial abundance, which you have promised in your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, we're not going to have a lot of scripture uh, this week, but we are going to have, we are going to start with a long one. Uh, and unfortunately, um, I hope I can read it off the, the back screen, but this is uh, the parable that you all know. Um, and actually, I think what I'm going to do is summarize it because the principle of this parable, and it goes um, from Matthew 25, 14, all the way to 29, uh, relates to the fact that uh, those who have been given much, much is expected. Those who have been given a little, less is expected. But each one, each of us as servants, has a responsibility to do uh, what, with what the Lord gives us, to invest wisely, to use those funds wisely. And my point uh, in bringing this parable up to the forefront, and it is in your handouts, the larger handouts, is that there is an action orientation here. This is not about passivity, in other words, I'm going to pray for the wealth transfer, I pray for abundance, I pray for this. I pray. That's important to ask, we talked about that last week, but there are also actions that we are required to take as part of wisdom. And if you look in Proverbs, you're going to see more about wisdom than just about anything else. It's more important even than finances. Uh, Proverbs 3.14, those who find wisdom are blessed and the gain from wisdom is better than the gain from gold. And you know, when you think about the miracles in the Old Testament, many of them were not so much about abundance, they were about sustaining people, right? Think about the 40 years that the Israelites were in the desert, and what did they receive? The miracle that they received every day was manna. That was not abundance, that was what they needed. So the miracles tended to supply what was needed for people, and that's great, and it's important, but the abundance wasn't there. Where was the abundance for the, for the Israelites? In the promised land. They weren't ready for it. They didn't do what they needed to do in order to receive the real abundance that God had for them in the promised land, and we all face that same exact thing. So we need to understand that there are things that we need to be doing, principles we need to be adhering to if we want to get more than the minimum. And so if you're praying for the big wealth transfer, 
You know, I do actually believe it will happen, but I think we have a role to play, a job to do in order to take part in what God has in mind for us. All right, we're going to get down to real basics. Financial practices, and, and we're covering a bunch of things. We're going to have financial practices today. I should have uh, mentioned this in, in the summary. We're going to talk about some financial practices. We're then going to get a little bit into Ramsey's steps of financial peace. And the reason I want to do that is the financial practices are one thing, but the overwhelming problem that everybody has in finances is it's overwhelming. I got to save for retirement. I got kids I got to put through school. I'm not making ends meet. I've got way too much debt. The problem is we don't have the intentionality of doing what we need to do in our finances. And the only way to do that is to tackle them one at a time. So we've got to, we're going to show you very careful, measured steps to begin to get yourself into what I'll call financial freedom or financial peace. I'm not going to say retirement. I don't actually believe in retirement. Refirement, maybe, but not retirement. Okay. But I want you to get to a place where you make the choices and it isn't the, the job that you have to do that's forcing you into your choices, that you have some financial freedom. So in your refirement, you can do exactly what God has for you and not necessarily what you need to do uh, in order to meet your financial goals. So that's what I want to do. I want to get us to that place. And it isn't going to be easy, but it does start with this, living on a budget. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it? And Proverbs 14, 29, he who is slow to wrath has great understanding, but he who is impulsive acts folly. Okay, a budget is the single most important foundation, and most of you know this. Most of you also have a tremendous problem with sticking to a budget. I'm sure... I'm going to guess 70% of you have tried it. I'm going to guess 80 to 90% of you who have tried it have failed. I'm going to talk about why you failed, but I'm also going to talk about why it's important to make sure you get on that budget. Okay, a couple of tips. There we go. Uh, a couple of tips. First of all, assign every dollar of income in your budget. Now, I'm going to show you an example, uh, uh, $10,000 a month. I know that's probably a lot of money, but it's easy to do the math. <laughs> that's why I picked the number of 10000 So I'm going to show you that, and you can scale it up or down to whatever your income is, but you get a sense for how a budget might look for a $10,000 income a month. So assigning every dollar of income, I'm going to encourage you to budget every single month. You get toward the end of the month, Start your budget for the next month. Why is that important? Because your income moves around. You're going to have a better idea of what things are going to look like for the next month if you do it monthly. You start from scratch. Now, you're going to find as you do this, it's actually easier and easier because many of your expenses are going to be repeatable. It will not be so hard to do it every month. But you have to start from scratch. Give yourself a day to do it. And after, after you've done it a while... I promise you it won't take you more than 15 or 20 minutes to do it every month. Okay, a lot of freedom in creating a budget, but once you create it, you gotta stick to it. So you will have freedom to do what you wanna do to meet your goals, and we're gonna get into that, but then you gotta stick to it. And I'll say one other thing, um, budget, creates clarity. You're going to find out where your spending is going because right now a lot of you don't even know where it's going. But it also has to create constraints outside the budget. And that's what I'm going to share with you that I don't think you've heard before. How we're going to use the budget to constrain your spending so that you don't end up spending in places that you yourself don't want to spend it. So we're going to get into that. Um, a couple of other tips um, if income is variable, try to budget for necessities in what I would call a, an amount of income that you can count on in a given month. And then you might have things like entertainment and dining out 
that may be more based on your variable components of your income. In other words, if you're on commission, and let's say you know that you're gonna make a certain amount every month for sure, budget to that amount, but maybe you don't budget for entertainment, let that come out of the variability of your income, that kind of thing. So even if you have variable income, you're still going to budget, you're just probably gonna budget to a tighter level. Let's talk about the one of the first categories. All right, now I know this is gonna get really busy and don't worry so much exactly what everything is, but the reason I'm doing this is if you're all gonna start, I wanted you just, just to have a list of categories of things that a typical budget would have. So this is all in your handout, so you don't have to take a picture, Sam, unless there was none left back there, which might be the case. <laughs> so it's all in your handout. Um, and this is the first category. So these are expenses, and this is, by the way, one of the problems. People spend too much because they think their income is a certain amount, and they don't recognize the fact that nearly half of it is probably coming out day one out of fixed expenses, okay? A lot of people, people who make, let's say, 10,000 a month, they're thinking, oh, wow, that's a lot of money. Uh, there's a $6,000 thing that I want to get. Well, I, I can afford it. That's not even my monthly amount. Well, they can't afford it because all of these things are coming out. Rent or mortgage, gas, electric, water, landscaping, etc. So put in these first category, these are expenses that you can count on and do not change every month. This is the easiest thing to do because it's not changing, this category of investment of, of line items never changes in any given month. That's your first set. The second one is the non-monthly expenses. Now, these are things that you know you're gonna spend, but you kind of think about it annually. So, for example, gifts. You know about Christmas is coming. You know you have, let's say, property taxes. Let's say you want to save $12,000 a year, this, this family, for vacations. Okay, you know uh, roughly an annual amount of these expenses, but what you want to do is divide it by 12, and now you're going to put aside this amount of money every single month to be able to cover these kinds of things. Car repairs you could put in here, it could also go in another category, but these are things that you're gonna make an estimate for the year, divide by 12, so that when they do happen, you're not gonna run short because you've started a reserve for these things. Now, remember I told you that one of the reasons people have trouble with their budgets is because it, it shows you clarity, but you still overspend. So here's a way you can actually avoid that. So for example, and this is another category, these are non-fixed expenses that you don't really know how much you're gonna spend, but you know you will spend money on groceries, you know you will spend money on gas. So this category and the last category, which is all your discretionary stuff, dining out, okay? I put fun money, husband fun money. Well, say you wanna be able to buy your spouse a, a gift and you don't want him or her to know what it is, you could set aside something for that. But this category and the category before it, you can actually establish, here we go, a separate debit account. Now if you use a credit union, you can bring a credit union checking account all the way down to zero without having a minimum charge. And you can actually create separate accounts. So if you wanna know whether you can go to the movies or whether you can go out to dinner, Every month you have transferred the total amount of discretionary that you expect to spend in a given month, 1,250, into an account and you simply pull it out of that separate account. And when you're at zero, you stop. You will never overspend discretionary again if you set up a separate checking account. Every month when, you're, when your check comes in from wherever you work, you're gonna put 1250 of it into that account, and when you spend it, it's done. Okay, that is a really good technique in order to make sure you're not gonna overspend your budget, and you don't have to track it. You just watch that account. It's a debit account, it's not a credit card, it's a debit account, 
and that's how you do it. And you can have a sec if you want a second one for this category, you could do the same thing. The non-fixed monthly expenses, you could consider a separate account for that as well. So you would have three checking accounts, one where your check comes in and two other ones in categories that you will spend down over the month and when they hit zero, you're gonna stop. You will n if you do that, you will not bust your budget because you're gonna know that you don't have enough. Now, people bust their budget mostly because they use credit cards. And the problem with credit cards, other than the interest rate and other than the debt that gets out of control, is that the, the payment of it is not in the same period as when you, you bought the item. So you get all completely confused about, wait, wait a minute, I don't pay this until next month, but I, I did it here. It's a disaster. You can't keep to a budget because you don't know where anything, when it was paid for. So in addition to the fact that I hate credit cards and I'm gonna ask you to commit plastic surgery and cut them all up, this is another real problem. You can, almost cannot stay on a budget if you use a credit card because it's impossible to track the timing of what you pay. Now, if you have a debit card, and I, I've now recommended three separate accounts, and you have three debit cards, and every time you go to the movies, you do it on one. Every time you do gas, uh, you do it on the other one. And now you know that you have enough in your budget because you still have money in your debit account. It's a really simple, easy method. Okay, we're gonna get past the budgeting stuff because nobody wants that, do too much of that. Okay, all right, I cover. Oh, one other thing, there is uh, as well, uh, if you want a, a decent app in order to track, and let's say you really don't want the separate accounts, then you can get the Every Dollar app, uh, which is, you can, you can download it, there's a free version and that will track everything. It will be a zero-based budget like we talked about, so all your income will have a home. And if you want to pay a little something for it, then it will actually connect to your checking account, and then you actually could avoid doing having those three accounts. You can do it using the paid app, which literally every time you uh, make a purchase in your checking account, you will see it flow through your budget automatically. So that's an alternative. I still recommend setting up the separate account as a surefire way of doing it, but if you don't want to for whatever reason, then you might consider the Every Dollar app, the premium version, which will link to your credit account and you'll see your balances decline over time. And you should, you should be able to stay within your budget. Okay, getting out of debt, you knew it was coming. The rich rules over the poor and the borrower servant to the lender. Now, I can't say that debt is a sin. It's not, in the Bible, I don't see where it's a sin, but I don't think it's blessed anybody either. So there's nothing positive about it that I can see. There's some negative, uh, and there also uh, is some reference to debt that is really not debt. It's because of the Jubilee system where debt is forgiven every seven years. So you're not supposed to, if you lend to your brother, you're supposed to forgive that debt. So I'm not sure I can put it in that category. But anyway, I do have an exception. I actually think mortgage debt is okay. Despite the fact that the root word of mortgage is mort, which means death. Okay, <laughs> maybe we should take that to heart. Um, but, I, but I do think every other kind of personal debt is not good for you whether it's car loans or leases, student loans, credit cards, I'm going to strongly recommend that one of the goals walking out of here is to get rid of that debt. And the reason is gonna become evident because when I show you how somebody earning a modest amount of money can retire comfortably, it's because they're not gonna have any debt. And, and if they have a house, it'll be paid for. And you can only do that if you start the process now, okay? Now, but Ron, everybody has a car loan. Well, it does seem to be true these days. It, didn't, it wasn't always true, but let's, let's talk about this. So the average car payment in this country is about $500. Most people are, have car loans from the age of 25 to the age of 65. 
If you invested the interest in the market earning 10%, and by the way, the markets earn 12% uh, average, but if you, if you earn 10%, you would have nearly $500,000 more of net worth at age 65. This is why the bank has all the nice furniture and you don't. Okay? <laughs> because they're making a lot of money on your car loans. Okay? It's not a big surprise to me that college isn't funded. Um, and by the way, leases are even worse because leases make it sound better because you're not financing the residual. But now when the lease is up, you know, what you have to turn the car in. Now you have nothing to drive. Or you're going to buy out the lease, which is a pretty large residual value. And guess what you're going to do? Okay, raise your hand if you've ever had a car lease. Once you're, no, don't raise your hand, it's all right. But once, you, once you've done it, you keep doing it, right? You're stuck. You need a car to drive, okay? And you're not going to be able to buy out the lease. The residuals are, are very high. So it's not even better. It seems better, but it really isn't, okay? Now I want to hit student loans really quickly. Student loans kill me. There's $110 billion of student loan debt that's out there. The average student has $30,000 of debt when they graduate. 12 years after graduation, the average borrower is paid off only about a third. Two thirds of graduates own $100,000 or more. And what's happened is schools have now become a business. And lending has become an incredible business. And so everybody in the process of college is telling 17-year-old kids who have absolutely no ability to make a financial decision, their guidance counselors are saying, don't worry, everybody gets a loan. Parents are saying, don't worry, I don't have the money, I have too, too many car loans, so I go get a loan. And, and by the way, everybody thinks that if they don't go to college, they're never going to succeed, which is so not true anymore, okay? The entrepreneurial, uh, the successful entrepreneurs, either they don't have an education or if they do, it, it's, uh, it's totally in a different field or it's from a community college or they've learned technology from the companies that they've worked for. It's, it's not what it used to be and when you think about the loans that these people take, now, it's incredible, and that's happened because tuition has skyrocketed because these schools are now all competing for everybody. So it's no longer uh, living in a dorm room, they're living in palaces, the gyms are incredible. Have you visited college campuses lately? You, you can't even believe what they're like, and that's because they're all competing with each other to get that 17-year-old kid to borrow money so that they can come to their school and pay all that tuition. So it used to be the number one goal when you got out of school was to get a car, maybe a house, a decent job, and now it's paying off loans. So anyway, just a little bit of the history. In 1958, the government set up their loan program. It was only $1,000 a year. And the thought was, hey, we want kids to go to school. It really creates a public good. They're going to get an education. They will give back to society more than, than we're spending. And I think that was a, a, a very good goal. Um, but anyway, then the banks were brought into the situation. The government started guaranteeing the loans. You had organizations like Sally May who guaranteed the loans so that the banks didn't have to underwrite anybody borrowing money because Sally May would pay them back. Then Sally May in the 1970s, Sally May is the Student Loan Marketing Association, Sally May went private. And when they went private, it became an unbelievable business. And the idea was how do we market and get as many people to borrow money as possible on these student loans? It's quite an amazing business. Okay. After graduation, six months after graduation, you gotta start making uh, repayments. And by the way, don't look for the government to bail you out because what's going on right now is an attempt to get votes, but the government is too vested in the entire program to seriously stop and forgive all of these loans. So students that are waiting for that to happen, as soon as elections are over, it, it's going to either be unconstitutional because of all the lenders that would get caught if they did that, uh, or, or it won't get anywhere at all in Congress.
one of the two. So what do you do? You have a kid. I'm not saying schooling is bad, but there are alternatives. First of all, there are trade schools, too. We, we, I don't want to uh, discount those. But there are also $3 billion of unclaimed scholarships every year. Most people don't bother looking for scholarships. And by the way, they're for everything. They're for tall people, short people. It, you, you can't even imagine all the scholarships that are out there. But most of them are $500 to $1,000. And so people say, oh, I have a big bill here. It's not worth going after. But what's been happening is if you decide to make it your job to work three hours a day uh, or, or, or five hours a day, to work on getting those scholarships. There are cases now of people pulling in seventy dollars to $100,000 of scholarships, just bundling up all these little tiny um, scholarships that are out there because most people say it's not worth doing, it's not enough money. But if you really work at it, uh, you can pull that kind of money from a scholarship. Uh, I know a few cases where it was done in four to five months, but people don't try. Now, add a strategy to that of working part-time so it's absolutely a proven truth that students who work during college actually do better in college. College courses are only three hours a day at most. The rest of it, I'm sorry to tell you, is a lot of partying and a lot of playing. So if you can get your, your kid to be motivated and do some work while they're going through college, um, they're going to actually do better in school. So now you've got some scholarship money working for you. You've got part-time. Now I'm going to tell you, if you really want to go to that top school, go to a community college for two years. There isn't, a, there isn't an employer on the planet, and we're a big employer where I worked. We couldn't care less where somebody went for the first two years. Couldn't care less. Go to two years community college, do really well, and if you, if you still want to get the, the fancy degree, you can still do it for, for half the money, okay? So that's another. Also, Christian schools, uh, provided you don't assume you're, you're not going to have your faith challenged in a Christian school, I could go into that. But Christian schools, state schools, uh, these are all opportunities. And by the way, as somebody who's a Fortune 100 company who hired many, many, many people, we literally stopped hiring Ivy League students in the last few years because the entitlement was crazy. Much better is to hire somebody from a, a unknown school that's working their butt off, that, that's working while they're going to school, doing well, and actually wants to, to learn. So high, employers are changing the way they're viewing people too. All right, I know I spent a lot of time on this, but there's so many myths around college right now, I, I just have to tear them up. Okay. Uh, ask me in the quest Q and A, we'll t I'll talk about 529, that's fine. 529 planes. Okay, so we're gonna talk about um, how to reduce debt, so, but I wanna move ahead a little bit quickly here. Okay. This is a, one you might not have expected. Foster high quality relationships. Really important. Corinthians 15, 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Do not be deceived. Evil money corrupts good habits. There is a huge correlation between the wealth of those you hang out with and your own wealth. You ready for this study? Over 10 years, studies show that your income will be within 10 to 20% of the average of the 10 people you hang out with. It's true with a diet. It's, it's, it's true with reading scripture. If you're around people that read scripture, you're going to be reading scripture. If you're around people that are intercessors, you're going to be praying. And so if you're around people who either have wealth or, or more important, have a wealth mindset, you will have that mindset as well. Okay, what do I mean by a mindset? People who understand the difference between buying something that grows in value, like adding to a home, versus a depreciating asset like a boat or a car. Here's a test. Ask a friend of yours how much did their new car costs. See if they say $40,000 or $300 a month. If they say $300 a month, they don't have that mindset. They're thinking the way people who don't have means think. 
They're thinking about a payment. And what you want to do is stop thinking that way. You want to be thinking about what you're paying for an item in its cost, not its financing cost. And it, this isn't rich versus poor. It really is a mindset. Um, things like paying lump sum for insurance to save money instead of paying it each month. Or at least, are you considering that? Um, are you net worth focused instead of asset focused? Somebody says, oh, yeah, I have a... I have assets of, you know, 400,000. And then you, you, wow, that's amazing. Until you find out there's 500,000 in debt and you actually have a negative net worth. So you wanna start thinking about net worth, which is your assets less your liabilities. And that's the way you should be thinking about what you have. A wealth mindset is future oriented, okay? You're investing today for a future benefit. So that includes giving, that's a kingdom benefit, a kingdom investment, and it includes investing in the market wherever else you're doing. Wherever you are deferring gratification. All right, the next one. Save and invest. There is a desirable treasure and oil in the dwelling of the wise, but a foolish man squanders it. And of course, I think everyone knows that oil was extremely valuable in, in biblical times. So obviously saving money for emergency helps you avoid debt. Um, and we're gonna, we're gonna talk a little bit about that. Um, but your rate of return is actually not that important. Wow. You're not gonna hear that from finance people. A rate of return is not as important as you think. First of all, rates of return as an absolute don't necessarily show you the risk adjusted return. In other words, Something that only earns 3% but has no risk is a lot different, is, you know, you can't, it's hard to compare to something that earns 12 but has a ton of risk, right? So there's the one problem with just comparing interest rates is what is the level of risk you're taking? That's one problem. But the second thing is, the reason I say your rate of return isn't as important is because what is more important is actually saving is actually putting money aside every month to work for you. Okay, now yes, it, it is gonna matter where you put it, but what I'm trying to tell you is just the act of doing it is important. And here's, a, here's another fact. Financial management is probably only 60 to 70% math. It's 30 to 40% psychology. And you're gonna see that in a few minutes. And because there's a lot of psychology, you have to do things in, and be habitual about the good practices like saving every single month, okay? Now let's take a look at some mathematics here. Compound interest, which God invented, by the way, probably on the ninth day. Okay, so person A saves $100 per month from age 25 to 35 and never saves again, so 10 years. Person B saves $100 per month from age 45 to age 65, so that's 20 years. Person A at the age of 65 will have $406,000 at a 10% return, 826,000 at 12%, the average of the equity market. Look at person B. Only 76,000 at 10% and 99,000 at 12%. He actually never catches up, okay? And so even though person B saved twice as much, by doing it in his early years, person A will actually end up more because of the compounding effect. See what I'm getting at? It's more important to start early. Get your kids to start. I don't care if it's $50 a month. Get them to start investing so that they will begin to see the compounding in the proper order. We're going to get to that in a minute. All right. Proverbs 13, 11. Wealth, wealth from get which scheme, rich schemes quickly disappears. Wealth from hard work grows over time. There's no question the Bible has all of this in it. It's a question of whether we can find it. Okay. And this one we talked about last time, give with a cheerful heart. Uh, the reason I'm bringing it up here again, and here's 2 Corinthians 9, 7, so let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a 
a cheerful giver, giver. We talked about tithing, but I just put it in here as a financial practice because I want to make sure that when you do your budgets, you've got your giving in there, okay? So I put it in there as well. Okay. Um, and the next one is managing risk. All right, so this is one that people hate to do this, but it's really important. Uh, life insurance, the big question is always term versus whole. People prefer term, it's cheaper uh, because it's very specific to life insurance. If you have one person earning money in your family and that person were to die, if, if your spouse and your kids would be in big trouble, boy, you better have some, some life insurance. And term insurance uh, is cheaper, but it is also limited. Right, so you might buy 20 year term or 30 year term and after 20 years and 30 years, you're done. And if you need more insurance, you're gonna to have to buy more. And by the way, you may not be as healthy, so you're gonna get re-underwritten at that age and it could be extremely expensive. Now, I understand why most financial advisors say term. They want people to take care of their life insurance and move on to other things. I'm just gonna say this. Just be really careful about it. I bought term insurance uh, when I was young and every policy I bought I regretted because after 20 years was up and after 30 years was up, guess what? I still needed insurance and I didn't have it. So I had to go through the whole process again. So I'm just gonna say it's, there's not a simple answer necessarily. There's also some fairly sophisticated things you can do with permanent life insurance, which we can get into uh, if people want to talk about that. But anyway, this is where you want to sit down with an advisor. You're going to go over your budget and see what kind of life insurance you can afford and, and what makes sense for you. Disability insurance, the probability of needing it is actually one in three. So this is a tough one, right? People don't want to spend the money on disability insurance. And you may have this at work may or may not be enough depending on your work. It usually should cover somewhere between 60 to 80% of income as a rule of thumb. Long-term care. Uh, the probability of long-term care needed is uh, 48%. So I used to work for an insurance company, so I know the numbers. Um, I should say it this way, probability is 48% that people turning 65 will need some kind of long-term care. Now you can combine it with life insurance, okay? You can bundle a life insurance policy that pays out in a long-term care situation. So you, you kind of can get paid out whether you live or die. It's a little more expensive, but that may be a way to handle both life insurance and long-term care. Um, now, here's one of the reasons why I do think it's important to work toward owning your own home. Um, there's nothing wrong with renting, and you can even rent for many years, but eventually if you own your own home, then you're, first of all, you're not subject to landlords that can raise rates, uh, can raise rents, that's number one. But number two, it is highly likely that if you own a home, that will be what you use to finance if you ever have nursing home needs, okay? It is a really good way to think about an asset that you can sell later in your life. If you need to go to a nursing home, that's a, that's a way to do it. So I do encourage people, and this is another reason why I think a mortgage is okay, because I think the end goal of having the house is worth it, okay? Now, I will say this. I'm gonna tell you, get a 15 year loan, not a 30 year loan, because you wanna get out of that debt quickly. I'm gonna tell you not to have your, your mortgage payments be more than 25% of your income. I wanna give you rules of thumb of doing it so that you don't become house poor and unable to afford that house. And if you can't meet those requirements, just wait. Keep renting, there's nothing wrong with it. Uh, but a good time to, to, to go in uh, is when you can cover those metrics. By the way, don't be too crazy about rates. People say, oh, rates are so high, I won't buy. If you can financially afford it now, and I mean afford it with the parameters I said, don't try to time the rate market because if rates go down, what are you gonna do? You're gonna refinance, okay? And if rates go up, guess what? You made a good choice. 
okay? So you shouldn't make the decision based on where interest rates are, based on your affordability and the property that you find that, that you think meets your needs. I also don't try to time the real estate market because if you look back in history, real estate has pretty much done this couple of dips in 08 and a few other things, but don't try to time that. I, I don't try to time it, and I used to look at that stuff 24-7. I wouldn't even attempt to try to, to time the market. So make it the decision based on those other things. Uh, have a will. Uh, oh, wait. Uh, okay, liquidity. Uh, th so these are things you need. You probably need to talk to an advisor. How much liquidity do you need? So a lot of people... Uh, worry so much about retirement, you actually probably need more liquidity in your early re refirement years, say it that way. You actually spend more in those years than you will much later. So the timing of liquidity isn't uh, maybe as intuitive as you think. Uh, and also it's important to understand what your investment risk parameters are, okay? Over 30 and 40 years, equity investments are going to do fine, but how are you going to feel about a one or two year period where you lose, you know, could lose 30, 40, or even 50% of your money if you go back to 08? If you can't handle the truth, <laughs> you, you shouldn't have that kind of strategy. And a lot of people think, they, oh yeah, I'll be fine. And then when it happens, they're like, oh man, what kind of advisor do I have? Well, you put your money in, in risk assets, that were designed to be there for 30, 40 years. Stop looking at the market every day. Okay. Um, wills. Get one. Everybody should have a will. You can go to now, you can go on mamabear.com and do a will in a couple of hours. Okay. All online. New, works in New Jersey. Uh, couple, I think it costs maybe 200. I don't I haven't looked in a while. But check it out. Get a will. Believe me, you may think that everybody in your family is a Christian and everything's fine until Uncle Edward <laughs> says, I should have had that money. Trust me, get a will. Uh, somebody asked me about trusts, so I'm just going to touch on it briefly. Um, first of all, attorneys love to sell trusts. They, a lot of attorneys make a lot of money on trusts. I'm going to tell you that most people don't need them. Okay? Now, there may be some circumstances, however, when you do. So if you are worried about estate taxes, trusts are a good way to avoid them. Does anybody know what the federal exemption for estate taxes is right now? 13.7 million, I think. Now, it is scheduled to be cut in half in 20, January of 2026. So it will go down to six and a half million or a little more. But unless you think that your um, net worth is going to be significantly more than that, I struggle to see why you, you feel you need to have what's called an irrevocable trust, which is what's going to help you the most in tax situations. Now, states have some as well. New Jersey doesn't, though. Um, but there are some states, so that could be another reason to do it. So I don't think state taxes is a great reason unless you're very, very wealthy, and then maybe it is. The other reason people are doing trusts is because they want to have direction of their money when they die in a certain way. That's different. Those are revocable trusts. Those are trusts where the grantor, which is probably you, have control over the assets. You can do lots of things with them. And then when you die, the trust document and the trustee is going to stipulate how those assets will be spent. So if you have you know, a son that unfortunately it spends like crazy and you don't want them to get your money, you can set up a trust that will dole the money out in a certain way, et cetera, that kind of thing. So those are different. Uh, those can make sense in an individual situation. Okay, so somebody asked, so I thought I would cover that a little bit. Okay. It's not an ordinary night at church. Okay. Seven steps to achieve a net worth of $1 million and as little as 40000 a year. Okay. So this is where we want to go. Um, this is, we're going to get into some of the, these uh, Ramsey, he calls them baby steps. I think they're excellent, and I told you the main reason why, because they're sequential. You, all of this stuff is overwhelming. If you just think step, 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 
you can get there, okay? So step one, here we go. Save 1,000 to 1,200. This is your starter emergency fund. Your first job, all of you, if you wanna do this program, is you've got to save $1,000 to 1200 1200 maybe for a family, maybe 1200 if you are in a, um, a, a situation where you think you're maybe a little more likely to have problems uh, in emergencies. But the whole point of this emergency fund is when something happens, a, a small repair or something else, you don't want to go into more debt. I want you to put a hold on your debt day one. Like, let's stop borrowing more at least. We're gonna talk about eliminating it. But by having an emergency fund, hopefully you will not borrow more money to meet that emergency. It's liquid, this is not an investment, all right? So you're gonna put it in a money market or a savings account. Um, and don't think of it as an investment. Think of it as being there for an emergency, okay? All right. Step two, so now you've done that. Now we're gonna talk about paying down your debt, okay? Now this has to be a real intentional, this is the hardest of all the steps is to do this. Some people are gonna spend quite a bit of time. Remember when I told you to make your budget? One of the things you're trying to do with your budget is land on an amount of money that you are actually going to use to pay down debt every month. The whole purpose of your budget, at least from the beginning, later on it will change, but at the beginning, the purpose of your budget is to figure out a dollar amount that you are actually going to appropriate from your money to pay down your debt, okay? So I've given you a bunch of, let's say you have somebody with a car loan of $10,000. I okay, did this when rates were lower, 3%. So their monthly payment is 180. You have a credit card of $5,000 at 17%, the payment of 71, and a mortgage of 200,000 at 4%, the payment of 950. So a total payment of $1,200 a month. Now, back to that beginning step when you set up your budget, let's assume that you have an allocation of debt pay down of 1,500. Right? So, so in the first month, there's an extra $300 that's going to be used to pay what? Principal. Not interest, principal. Now, if you do this, I'm going to suggest that you use what's called a debt snowball. What is a debt snowball? There are two ways to pay off debt. The mathematical way is pay the highest interest rate first and then pay the lowest at the end. That's the way it should work mathematically. And I'm going to tell you, don't do it that way. Because I told you, 70% of it is psychological. So I'm going to tell you to pay the smallest debt first. First of all, the amount of savings is trivial. You think it's a lot of money. It's nothing. But what is really important is when you pay the small dollar amount first, you get a psychological boost from doing that. And the money that you were then using on that debt, you're now gonna to apply to the next biggest one. And you're gonna see a snowball effect. Okay, now how does this work in this case? Okay, so of the $1,500, the 300 is first gonna to go to the, to the credit card, and that will be gone in 16 months. But now all the money that you used to pay for the credit card, is now going to be, you're still paying 1500 every single month, even though that debt is gone. Don't reduce your payment. You're used to paying 1500 Keep paying 1500 You're not going to notice it in your budget. It's the amount you're used to paying, but now you're going to apply it to the second debt. And pretty soon your car loan will be gone in one and a half years. Now you're going to take the car payment and the credit card payment you used to have, and you're going to apply it to your, to your mortgage, and in 11 years, actually sooner, because there's some principle in the 950, you're going to be done with all of your debt, including mortgages. From that 300 a month, it's all gone. It's intentional. You're using the snowball to really speed dial or speed up your debt repayment. Okay, I, you're not investing yet. I do not want you investing. I want you paying down your debt. See, most of you are like, ah, 401k, and I got, the, I got to do the 529, I got to get the... 
put on your own mask first, and then you put on the oxygen mask of your kids. Okay? Get yourself in order. Then worry about everybody else. Okay. Permanent emergency fund comes next. That 1,000 to 1,200 is not enough. Okay? That was just there so you wouldn't borrow more money. Bigger things are going to start to happen to you. So now you want three to six months of expenses. Again, in a savings account. It's not invested yet. Again, this is to make sure that when the water heater breaks down, you're not putting it on your credit card. You've already cut up your credit card. I forgot to tell you that. <laughs> you did your plastic surgery. You don't have a credit card anymore. You've cut that up. You're only using debit cards. Okay? Three to six months of expenses. That's number three. You still haven't invested. Now, for the first time, you're going to start putting 15% of your income into retirement accounts. Okay, the best thing, of course, if those of you work for companies and they match, you want to take advantage of a match. If you don't know what I'm talking about, don't worry about it. Some of you know. The next thing is Roth. So in a Roth IRA, and I believe you can do, what, 7,000? Help me out, Glenn. I know you're here. 8,000? Yeah. 8,000. And there's a backdoor way of doing more, as you probably are well aware. So um, anyway, so the Roth IRA is great because you're taking after-tax dollars, you're putting it aside, but when you, that's going to accrue year after year after year. When you pull it out and that thing's grown to thousands and thousands of dollars, it's completely tax-free. So Roth is the best thing going. After that, you have the 401ks and the 403bs, and they're still tax advantaged, but those are pre-tax, so they will accrue faster, but when you pull them out, you're going to pay taxes. So that's not quite as good as Roth, still very good, still beats the last category, which is a brokerage account. Okay, so that's the way I would sequence. Uh, now, those are vehicles. That doesn't tell you how they're invested. That's just the vehicle that you're putting your money in. Okay. We'll get to where you put it in a second. So it's important, though, to start this as soon as you can. As soon as you get to this step four, do it. Because remember I showed you the compounding? The effect of that is crazy over decades. Okay? So you want to start that compounding thing, uh, you know, as quickly, as quickly as you can. Okay. Um, let's do an example. Okay, effects of compounding, consider risk tolerance. Okay, uh, those are some ideas for where you could put the money, even if it's index or mutual funds or ETFs. You might get a uh, large cap, mid cap, small cap. This is where an advisor can help you if you're not sure which ones to do. But I'm going to tell you right up front, don't mess around with individual stocks. Just don't do it. I've never done it my whole life. And I actually learned how to look to analyze them. You don't have the time. You, don't, you need the diversification. Don't mess around. It's just my advice. You don't have to take it. But you should think about uh, funds that have multiple investing. And you, I just think it's, there's too much what's called idiosyncratic risk with a single stock. What do I mean by that? Oh, I don't know. Say a AAA company like Enron commits fraud <laughs> and goes down to zero. You can actually handle that in a diversified way if you have a fund. But if you put all your money in that stock because you analyzed it and it was a good stock, I probably would have put money in it if I believed in single stocks. Now, when you get an advisor, I'm just going to say it this way. You don't abdicate your responsibility of making financial decisions. So you want an advisor with the heart of a teacher. Okay? There's a few in our church. If you want to see me after, I can talk to you. But you want to have somebody that's going to teach you, not do for you. You still should be doing this for yourself. Okay. All right, compound. Let's talk about how this works. This is the fun part, right? So we're not going to assume any increase in income. So remember I said you earn $40,000 a year after taxes, okay? So that's about 3333 3 a month. 12, let's say you put $1,200 in rent or a house payment. $1,600 we're going to assume for other expenses, and that leaves about $500 a month. Okay? 
if you put it in a Roth tax-free, okay, by from age 30 to age 65, at 8%, you're going to have 1.15 million. To earning 10%, in all cases, by the way, you only put 210,000 in. Look how the Look how the compounding affected your net worth. You only put in 210,000, and by the age of 65, you have 1.15 million. And this assumes no increase in your income, because you're gonna tell me, well, what about inflation? Well, I'm gonna tell you that your income is gonna go up with inflation. So these numbers will be higher, okay? So, but anyway, let's take out inflation, let's take out no increases in, in your income, 10% you're gonna have 1.9 million, and 12% you're gonna have 3.3 million. All of this doesn't work if you're paying car loans and leases, okay? Because you're not gonna be putting the money aside to do this. But now, let's say you followed the steps and you're able to achieve $2 million. Now you've got Social Security, assuming $2 million net worth now, no loans, nothing else, if you withdraw 4% a year, you now have got $80,000 of additional income on top of Social Security. Think you can live on that? I think if you were used to living on 40, you could live on that. You see how the effect of getting rid of the debt, saving a little at a time, sequentially work your way through it. It's all overwhelming if you don't do it one step at a time. Step five and six, okay, consider a college fund. This can be done simultaneously with the other one, with four, which is the 15%. But just remember everything else we talked about. Um, step six, oh, this is another thing. Consider at this point, you're putting in 15% because you need that compounding. You still have some extra money left over. I'm going to tell you to pay off the mortgage. I don't care if it's a 3% mortgage. Now, advisors hate this. Okay? Advisors say, no, 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 I can do so much better than that. I can earn 10, 12%. So don't pay off your mortgage. That's financially stupid. Here's what you ask your advisor. Do you own a home? Yes. Do you have a mortgage? Yes. If you had a paid off house, completely paid off, would you t borrow money off your house and put it in the market? No, why not? Because intuitively you understand that there's a risk difference, okay, between having money in the market and paying off a mortgage because that's a risk-free investment. If you have a 3% mortgage and you pay down your mortgage, you got a risk-free 3%, no risk whatsoever. So I highly, highly recommend you pay, you pay off that mortgage. Uh, and again, think about it. If you had a paid off house, you wouldn't borrow money and put it in the market. None of you would do that. So you intuitively know. It's the same thing. It's exactly the same thing. All right? If you have a paid off house and you borrow money and put it in the market, it's exactly the same as you have a mortgage on your house and you have money in the market. You just borrowed money to put it in the market. Same thing, okay? Okay, the last thing that you can do with your money is consider, now you can consider lots of alternatives. You have you've now have a paid off house, you've done all of these things, and now you wanna widen your kingdom impact through giving. Give yourself a little permission to enjoy life too. You can only invest, give, or spend. Those are the only three things you can do with your money. So you can consider other things, but, but you're gonna give money, it's just a wonderful feeling. And you're gonna get to that point and you're gonna do a lot of that. Okay, real quickly, financial myths. I promise you this is gonna answer a lot of questions, so I know we're getting into the, it's getting late and I apologize, so I'll go through these quickly. Eliminating debt will hurt my credit score, which must be avoided at all costs, no. My credit score has been going down every year for the last 10 years. Why is that? Because I don't borrow money anymore. If you don't borrow money, the banks say you obviously are a terrible person. And so your credit score starts to go down, okay? You, credit score is a measure of how good you play with the banks, the ones with the really fancy furniture that look better than yours. 
So don't play that game. You don't need a credit score if you have no plans to borrow money. Okay? It's just, it's out there. It's TikTok. It's the culture. Everybody says it. It must be true. I need a good credit score. Stop borrowing money. You don't, we won't care about your credit score. Okay, borrowing is the only real way to fund college. We already, we already talked about that. One cannot truly succeed without a We talked about that. An important mortgage benefit is the tax deduction. No, it's not. To pay $10,000 a month and get a $2,000 deduction, how about this? How about giving $10,000 to King of Kings and you'll get the same deduction? Okay? You're still paying more money for the small amount. Or to any, sorry, any institution that is kingdom-oriented. Um, I can invest and do better than my mortgage is costing so I shouldn't pay it down. We just covered that one, right? That's the whole, the whole point of the riskless investing and paying it down. I can pay extra on my mortgage and turn a 30-year into a 15. That's good math, and it's true. A 30-year loan gives me more flexibility because it has a lower payment. Here's the problem. Nobody does it. They do it for like two months. You will have a 30-year loan. You are not going to double your payments and get down to 15 because when the water heater breaks down, you're not going to do it or anything else that happens. So that's nonsense. I'm sorry. I just ask and the guys who work with uh, Glenn, you work with people. Um, I know Eric does. I, I promise you, people think they're going to do it, and they just don't. Here's another one. I will be generous after I'm wealthy. Now, you're going to be the same. Okay? If you're generous now, you will be generous later. I can't rent a car without a credit card. This is actually an interesting one. In some cases, it's harder to rent a card without a credit card. But now, most of the major companies do allow it. They just will take some money and they will hold it. They'll put it on hold. So make sure you call ahead of time, but you don't need a credit card to rent a car anymore. But you do have to call ahead. And you also may have some restrictions, like one way, sometimes one way rentals are hard, but if you return it to the airport, you're, you're gonna be okay. Just call in advance. I can't get a mortgage without a credit score. Eh, not true. So people are told this all the time, and that's because the banks don't want to bother doing the homework, but the reality is they do what's called manual underwriting all the time. So if you do not have a credit score because you don't have debt, but you pay your rent, and it's time for a mortgage, you say, I'd like for you to do manual underwriting. And they will do it. Most banks will do it. And if they don't, you, f you can find one that does. Plenty of them do it. Okay? That's a myth. Nothing wrong with credit cards. I pay them off each month to get the miles or other benefits. The problem is people don't actually do that. The banks are not stupid, okay? You think that, that, that you're getting all these benefits and that there's the bank's not getting it? No, the bank knows that you think you're going to pay off your credit card every month, but most people don't. And most people don't do it. They get stuck and they end up paying the minimum because something happens and now they're paying the 17 to 23% interest. So uh, it's really not worth the, uh, the extra miles. I don't think anybody ever got wealthy on, on miles. I just don't know of anyone. I can use credit card specials to get 0% financing. That's, I did have it up here, Rich. So this is the one that says, hey, I got this offer from, who's the one that does? Capital One does this a lot. Uh, if I take my balance and I send it over to Capital One or some other uh, offer, then I'm going to have 0% financing for three months. Why wouldn't I do that? Again, this is math versus psychology. You fool yourself into thinking you've actually done something, but you haven't done anything. You've just shifted it over, over the debt, okay? And now after the two months, you're going to start paying interest again. You better pay it off. Oh, and by the way, did I mention that you've now set up a new credit line with a new credit card? The old credit line just went to zero. So if you run into trouble, you've got a brand new credit line you can draw on it, and the old one as well. You see the problem? You just transferred to a new, to a new credit card company, but the old one now has a zero balance, which you are going to draw on it or likely to draw on it. So this 0% jumping from one to the other can really get you into trouble. Next one, 
Uh, debt consolidation is a good way to reduce debt, and it lowers my monthly cost. I hate these. These are all out there now. SoFi, there's so many companies that are trying to get you to, they, they advertise, eliminate your debt, call this company up. What is it? It's debt consolidation, one low monthly payment, okay? Here's the problem. Psychologically, you now believe you've done something about your debt problem when you have done nothing. And you're not going to think about it. Remember the intentionality that we talked about of really focusing on putting that extra money on the debt? Well, you just think you did something. You consolidated your debt. How smart was that? I have a lower payment. You haven't done anything. You still have the same amount of debt outstanding. Now, you're making that wealthy, that bank. They're really happy to have you now as their customer. They just managed to get your money from Citibank over to SoFi. So they're pretty happy that you did it. And you have lowered a slight amount, a little bit less than it was before. But guess what just happened? You know that city card, credit card that you now transferred over? That line is zero. If you run into trouble and you kind of need some money, you have that line again. So now you, people who transfer their money into debt consolidation a couple years later find themselves having run their balances up again on those old credit cards that they transferred over. It's too tempting. Psychology, it's bad. You haven't really done anything. Filing for bankruptcy is a way to get rid of my debt problem. Okay, for a couple of things. First of all, by the way, those student loans we talked about, they, they continue in, um, in bankruptcy. So you won't get rid of that. And the car and the house that you think you, you're gonna have free and clear, nope. If, you file for bankruptcy and still want to live in your house, then you have to pay the loan. If you move out, then you can extinguish the loan. If you give up your car, then you can extinguish the, the debt. Okay, so bankruptcy, I really don't recommend going that way, and it, and it really doesn't do as much as you think it might do. And that is it. I'm sorry it took longer. I do want to pray. I, I will take questions, and I, I do want to, um, but I do want to pray first. Okay, Father God, we thank you. We thank you that everyone here is seriously taking kingdom principles to heart, that we are meditating on your word, that we are doers of your word, that we will sow good seeds into your kingdom and that we will pray into your promises. Father God, we come to you right now and we just pray that hearts and minds will be open to doing those things. And tonight I bless each and every one of you here that as we pray into God's promises of, of life and abundance and wealth, that we will see wealth in our lives, not just financially, but our entire whole being. So for Father God, we pray and I pray for everyone in this room to receive the blessings that you have for them as kingdom wealth is what you have in mind for all of us in Jesus' name. Amen. That was a combination blessing and prayer, I think. Anyway, questions? Yes. I'll repeat it. So the, the question is uh, the 529 plans. Yeah, those are, those are great ways to save for college. Um, I have no problem with doing them. The tax benefits are good, and, and there are even stipulations and ways you can get at your money if the kids go in a different direction. So yeah, I think those are really uh, good vehicles for your kids. But also consider the other things that we talked about. Yeah. I'll repeat it. Testing. Oh, sure. Yeah. I'll repeat it.
Yes. Yeah. Do you have do you have a guarantee if you want to just can you Yeah, so there, there's different long-term care is asking about different long-term ter care options. So if you pay directly for uh, long-term care, that's going to be the most benefit. Even there there's usually limits as to how many years that they're going to pay benefits, but you know, I've seen long-term care policies that pay, you know, $12,000 a month uh, for benefit and they increase not just with inflation, but with healthcare inflation. Uh, but then they will go for a certain number of years. I think the average stay uh, in a nursing home is something like two and a half, three years maybe. Um, and then, but usually these benefits go for significantly longer than that. Uh, and then the hybrid ones, um, basically you can get them to match pretty easily the same benefits, but what they'll do is they'll take it away from your death benefit. So your death benefit comes down as you use the long-term care rider, it's called, or the rider on that policy. So you just, they're all different, and you, you just have to look at the different, uh, the different flavors of them. The most amount of care for the money is in the full policy, but if you need life insurance and you need long-term care, then that's a, an interesting option to take. Yeah. Tim. First of all, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, thank you because you covered so much of uh, Financial Peace University, which got us out of messes. So good, so good. Um, when it comes to life insurance, you talked about the term, and you know we're we're looking at different things even now, and uh, looking at a term that could be convertible into a whole. Yeah. Um, maybe you could talk about that. Because sure. That, that's a really um, good option. I, I love it. Uh, so, term that's convertible into whole life. That can be, just make sure that you are aware of when those convertibility time periods expire, which they do. So you have to watch for that. So basically a convertible term policy is one that starts out as term, you're paying the low premium, and then you have an option to convert it into permanent life insurance, which for some people like me um, is important. I, I want to explain why I like the whole life permanent policy. The reason I do is, A, I found out I still wanted it after the term expired, okay? Um, and so I thought it was important for my wife to have that income. But then later on, if you do all these steps and you actually have uh, gathered some wealth, you now shift the, um, the use of the policy from primarily a death benefit one to now it, it actually helps in estate planning. And so what it enables you to do is basically spend down your money and your heirs will get, can get the life insurance. So you don't have to worry. Now, in your situations, individually, that may not matter. But if that does matter to you, that's another thing that the whole life policy will do for you. And my second question has to do around, um, um, well, let me just give a little background. So we, we've eliminated our debt except for a little bit more I got into recently. Um, the savings, you know, the, the, the savings we were able to check off. And so now it's more at a point of, of investing. And I know that, you know, there's, um, there's passive investors and there's active investors. So yep. if you could kind of touch sure. into that a little bit. Yeah, so passive versus active investing. So passive investing is really things like investing in indexes like the S&P 500. So they're very low fees, right? You're not paying for uh, a manager. It seems like a pretty good deal. You get the market, okay, whereas everybody else compares themselves to the market. And by the way, indexes have done really well in the last, you know, 10 years. So it sounds like, you know, why not just go with an index? Here's the problem. 
if you buy the S&P 500, you now have a huge concentration in like four or five tech stocks. You think you're getting the market, and you are in a way, but the market has become dominated by a few players. So you're actually taking more risk than you realize. Now, tech has done really well lately, so the S&P's done pretty well lately, so it all sounds really rosy, but that's the problem. So with it, think about it. In, in an index, the index buys everything. That includes lousy companies. Whereas if you have a really good active manager that knows what they're doing, they're not going to buy the lousy companies that are all being valued because so many people are buying indexes right now. Okay, so there's actually a lot of value to be had by good active managers. So the real answer is probably both, uh, that it's good to have a certain amount in index strategies, but don't be afraid of active managers who know what they're doing. even though the, most people think that. <clears throat> Real quick, if you work for a company, pick anyone. If you work for a company, <laughs> if you work for a company uh, and they have you know, a stock plan where you can buy stock for 15% off, 20% off, your thoughts? So what I will tell you is, if, the, if you have that kind of discount, as soon as you have the ability to sell it, sell it. Take the discount, okay, if it's a really good one. Now, if it's 20 years and you can't touch it, I, I, don't, I don't think it's worth it. You, because so many people have gotten burned by having so much of their money uh, in one stock. And by the way, you're doubling your risk down because your risk, your your livelihood is from the same company that you're investing in. So you've just doubled your risk. If the company goes down, your livelihood is in jeopardy, and so are your investments. Four, four years? If, it, it, you know, if it's four-year vesting and it's really cheap, I, I might do some of it. But not a lot, because you are double, doubling down your risk. Yes, Michelle? Hi, thank you so much for this um, class. Um, I have a, well, a question slash a statement. I know there's a difference between index contracts and index as the S&P 500. Can you explain? I know one is where um, if you're saving in like, for example, an insurance um, policy, so that if when the market goes up, you're lucky. Um, when your market goes up, you benefit from the um, the interest. Yeah. But when the market goes down, you're locking your gains, then yeah. you don't lose. Can you so, explain a yeah, little bit more so you, and what the differences are? Thank so you. The, the, she's talking about equity indexed annuities and and other equity index products that allow you to ride the market. Okay, but not completely. So let's say the market goes up 12%, you might only get like nine, okay? But on the other hand, if the market goes down, you actually aren't gonna lose money. So they, they seems really attractive, right? Like, why wouldn't I wanna do that? The first answer is you can actually replicate that with a diversified portfolio. And the, it turns out, first of all, the companies that do it in the fine print they are allowed to change your certain allocations within your product that can kind of burn you. The expense loads tend to be really high. The amount of money they pull off the top that you're giving up is, is actually relatively high. And so um, it, it sounds attractive. It's a, great, it's a great marketing tool. You can replicate it using a, a diversified strategy. And usually the amount of equity that you're giving up uh, to me isn't worth it. So I don't love those products, um, but for some people, they, they may be appropriate. So I'll say it that way. Uh-oh, here comes the expert. Hi, um, so it's interesting because there has been a lot of conversation about trust. Yeah. And the question that I have is in regards to Medicaid, Medicaid planning 
versus long-term care or mm. using home. Is there a, um, should one be looked at above the other? Should all be considered, especially when planning for things like long-term care? Yeah, so a little bit now out of my expertise, but I think what you're getting at is the fact that in, in the case of Medicaid, you start to get into a problem because of the means testing behind Medicaid. So if you, you can use trusts to effectively uh, avoid that the amount of means. Now, my understanding was they're kind of cracking down on that, and it's not it's not as effective as it was. But I, this is I really don't know. I would probably okay. spend time with you to find out. So I don't know that all those rules. Real estate. <laughs> I will not go there today. But you you did uh, skip that one on the myths, and I'd like to have you comment and speak more about the importance of families doing together, oh, the couples yeah. doing the budgets yeah, yeah, together yeah, yeah, yeah. and all Thank that. you. I did yeah. skip that. Oh, thank I was trying to, because I saw the clock. So a couple of things. Um, a, lot of, a lot of couples keep their finances split. Don't do that, okay? From a Christian perspective, you are one with your spouse. And uh, finances is one of the top three reasons people separate and divorce. And you, you do not want to be hiding things from your spouse in any way. So if that's the first thing is you really should be working. Uh, your, all your accounts should be joint. You should, um, uh, you should be working your budgets together. You should be setting, you know, you should be planning your financial goals together and be in agreement and this can be an area of real disagreement. Uh, so it is important even before you get married, I would say, to have these financial discussions with your spouse so that you are on the same page. Like if you fully buy into this program paying down debt, but you're gonna marry somebody that isn't on that page, you're gonna have some problems. So the other thing is having separate um, finances, you know, you're hiding things. Generally speaking, there's, if you ask a couple why you're doing that, it, it's almost impossible to not get to the point where you're trying to hide something from the other person. It doesn't really make sense. So I strongly, strongly recommend that you, when you get married, everything comes together, and so does working on your financial plan and your financial goals. Really important. Adriel, that was awesome. Thank you. Did I miss something else you were trying to hit on as well? Is that it? Okay. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I get in the mail a lot of uh, junk mail, and um, not sure if this is considered junk mail, but it's um, a whole life insurance policy for my grandkids. Have you heard of Global, or I don't know if it's Global or Gerber or something like that. Gerber Life. Yeah. What's your idea? <laughs> no. I have to be, I actually have to be really careful about giving financial advice to, you know, I can only go so far here. Um, but I'm, I just say that I, I, I'll just tell you what I do. See my testimony you can't argue with. I throw those things away. Okay. I'll just say it that way. Yes. Oh, that's a great book. I really appreciate uh, this teaching. I really appreciate this teaching. Uh, I learned a lot today about being disciplined with your finances and your budgeting. Um, you know, it gives me a game plan to get out of debt more quickly, and I can you know, use my resources for the kingdom of God. Uh, and I also want to say this, this is a great book. I just want to make a comment. I really enjoyed learning. That's the one I wrote. It's uh, it's on the back. <laughs> That's very sweet. I actually put a sign up there if you wanted. It's ten dollars. I asked you to put it in the basket. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. And uh, <clears throat> yes. And one question. I'm learning about uh, tax liens and tax deeds for. Uh, in a, in investing, I don't know if anybody else has any comments, but if you know anything about that. About uh, taxes? Ta tax liens and tax oh. deeds. Tax de liens? Yeah, tax liens, so like tax liens, if somebody, 
Yeah, like for in investing. Yeah. So I'm having trouble hearing with the, through the mic. That Yeah. I was just going to say, can you really compete with the people that okay. can you compete with the people that do this 24 seven for a living companies that are set up? That would be my concern. It's interesting that you said that. Yeah. So be careful. Oh, okay. So this is has absolutely nothing to do with finance. Uh, an unexpected journey into the heart of God. It's actually my testimony, um, and you know, it's uh, really talks about how a Jewish person came to know Jesus Christ, uh, and who really didn't have any interest in knowing Him whatsoever. So um, it's a lot of fun to write this book. The, the reason I wrote it is that when I talk to people, sometimes they don't want to talk, but if you know them and you say, I wrote a book, they actually read it. People read the book because oh, they know the author. So it's like amazing. I, it's been great. So thank you. I think we're done. Oh, another question? No, it's actually a comment. Um, Financial Peace University, Dave Ramsey, one of the big things he talks about with the, doing the budget with your wife and yeah. husband is give each other grace because you're going to battle it out until you get that down. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Give each other grace. Yeah, that's, that can be really tough. By the way, that emergency fund, you may not feel you need it, but I bet your spouse will want you to do it. That's part of the piece. Anything else? I think we're done. Thank you. Yeah.